Well, look, Kay, I mean, I, I had the good fortune to have lunch uh, in October with Henry in his office in New York. And we were talking about uh, the conflict in Israel and Gaza, obviously, and he was talking about the peace processes that he had been working on in 1973 that ended the 1973 war and then led to uh, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1975. And it was quite remarkable to hear, to sit there, I'm lucky enough to sit there for a couple of hours with him, uh, just the two of us talking about uh, how peace is achieved and how uh, conversations need to happen. It was, I mean, it was quite the most extraordinary lesson in politics and in geopolitics. This is a guy who, whose uh, professional career spanned all the way from 1945, 46, when he started as a US soldier hunting Nazis in, in Germany, uh, all the way through to really, uh, as, uh, as Mark set out, talking to the Chinese leadership only a few months ago uh, and f being incredibly generous with his time to me in, in October talking about the Israeli peace. What was his view on the two-state solution and whether it's achievable? So his view was that it was achievable, but that it required uh, a significant change in both sides uh, and, and the perspectives, and it required uh, major commitments from others. It also required a realisation that one of the very uh, important spoilers in all this is Iran, and Iran has been a force for evil in the region uh, for many, many years, and Hamas is a product of that, but so is Lebanese Hezbollah, so, is the Houthi, so are the Houthis in Yemen, and that this is not uh, just about Israel and Palestine, but actually about a regional uh, dynamic, and that's what he was talking about with Egypt and the way that he brought Anwar Sadat into that uh, process was absolutely fascinating. And did he have a view about the ceasefire, the pauses, whatever you want to call it? We know that it's been extended for another day. I'm afraid we didn't get into, in, into that, but I must say I'm very pleased that the ceasefire, the pauses have been uh, extended by another day. I think it's incredibly important that we get uh, all support possible to get the hostages out and to get aid in to the Palestinian people. Uh, who've suffered so much in uh, recent weeks, uh, and to make sure that uh, what we're seeing is an opportunity to move on from this horrific conflict, this murder of over a 1,000 Israelis and this uh, terrible, terrible destruction that we're seeing in, uh, in Gaza, uh, and get rid of this vile death cult in, in Hamas uh, that has not just murdered Israelis, but actually has murdered many, many thousands of Palestinians as well. Mounting pressure on the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, two sides, either President Biden, who tweeted in his own personal capacity um, to uh, ask, to, <coughs> to suggest that there should be a continuation of the pause, at least for now, whereas the War Cabinet, some members of the War Cabinet in Israel, saying they'll walk out if this ceasefire doesn't end soon. Well, there's a, I mean, you'll see the, the War Cabinet is a, is a mixture of the, the Cabinet that Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu had uh, before October the 6th, and then some additional people like uh, General Benny Gantz, the former chief of the Israeli defense, and a yeah. uh, very impressive military leader, a very impressive individual. Uh, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, really manage a very, very difficult situation, which is, uh, can you imagine what would happen if a 1,000 British citizens had been taken hostage by a terrorist group? Can you imagine the pressure that would be on the government to get those people back. Of course, we would do absolutely everything we could to get those people back. So it's absolutely understandable that there are huge pressures on the Israeli government to get their hostages back and to make sure that this threat is removed. But there's also a pressure, which we're all very aware of, to make sure that any, any solution is sustainable. And that means having uh, the ability to having a, an enduring peace between uh, the Palestinians in Gaza and those Israelis who uh, live right next door to them. Uh, we have heard uh, I think it was about five o'clock yesterday afternoon, uh, reports from Hamas to say that they, um, the youngest <coughs> hostage, Kafir, um, his four-year-old brother and their mother, all killed, the, uh, Hamas says, in an airstrike uh, by Israel. It's about a week now since that happened, so if that was the case, why would they only be sharing that information now? Right. might be the question. But also, hearing from Alistair um, a little bit earlier on, he was saying, we've seen Hamas do this before. We've seen Hamas say that people are dead, and then they're not. Right, so I'm afraid, uh, you'll forgive me, but I'm not going to take anything that Hamas says um, uh, as uh, in any way particularly credible. This is an organisation that only a few weeks ago went over, murdered the rest of um, this poor baby's family, uh, then took him, his brother and his mother hostage, and now claims uh, that somehow 
the Israeli government is in some way responsible for this. I mean, it, it's completely absurd. This is an organisation that literally murdered the entire rest of his family and is now blaming somebody else for his death. It's, 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 I mean, if it wasn't so deeply offensive, it would be laughable. But it, it is extremely worrying that these claims are being made because we don't know whether this means that they are looking to hold the child for longer or whether they've lost control within Gaza or whether indeed in some way the poor child has been killed by them. Now, this is... I mean, I can't begin to imagine the pain uh, of uh, the whole family connected to, Father to this family. Father too, as well, of course. We have no yeah, absolutely. idea where he is. What we do know is that the UK is sending one of its most lethal warships to the Gulf. Tell me more. So, look, we have regularly put ships in places of need in order to make sure we're protecting our interests and supporting our allies. And ships offer many different services, including uh, the ability to uh, counter different uh, uh, threats to, to our partners. You'll have seen in, in recent weeks uh, Iranian-made cruise missiles were fired by Houthi rebels in Yemen, all the way up the Red Sea, aimed at Israel, and American warships brought them down. And we're looking to uh, make sure that we're part of uh, the coalition that of you know the American-led grouping that is is looking to protect and support peace and our partners in the region, including countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and and, and many others whom we've been working with. I've always found you to be a very consummate politician. Was the Greek Prime Minister grandstanding? Look, I think this is uh, one of those issues that has been uh, a long-standing uh, bugbear. I mean, look, Prime Minister Mutsukatakis has his own domestic politics. Of course, he's going to make comments like that. Um, you know, it's not always Why helpful. Did the Prime Minister just see him, though. Look, Even if it was to say, no, you're not having them back. So the Prime Minister, the, the way these all, the, the way these moments work, um, Kay, as you know very well, is the Prime Ministers spend about. Well, in fact, the Prime Ministers don't. The Prime Ministers' teams spend weeks before uh, uh, a meeting like this, deciding what they're going to talk about. And you get to a point where, if you haven't agreed what you're going to talk about, you know, frankly, maybe the meeting's not worth having. So you think it was right to cancel it? Look, I think... Uh, look, my own view is, is, is that uh, the Prime Minister had to make a decision. He's got many, many calls on his time, uh, and prioritising is, is a very difficult thing to do at Number 10. You're talking... You're tiptoeing through the raindrops there. I'm going to ask you about a Sky News exclusive instead. Broadcasting this morning shows how Just Stop Oil uh, trains its recruits, and they say that they are not in any way going to back down from their tactics and they're not sorry for uh, all the chaos they cause. What do you say in response? Look, I'd say very clearly that the British people made their views clear because the idea that stopping ambulances outside hospitals or blocking roads when people are trying to get to work is in somehow some justified protest is, is I'm afraid, is completely wrong. You, you know, we've all seen um, the deep frustration that we all share when some idiot is sitting in front of the road in order to try and make their case, when there's thousands of people who are trying to simply live their lives. It's, 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 it's gross selfishness. And it's quite right that we've changed the law on this and the police are taking very robust action. I want to talk about online fraud this morning. Well, online fraud, as you know, Kay, sadly, is where fraud has gone. You know, over recent years, we've all gone online and fraudsters have too. And fraud is not a victimless crime. I mean, you've reported on this extremely powerfully. Uh, and I've had letters from constituents and people I'm privileged to represent uh, who've had quite literally their lives ruined um, by not just the straight theft, but also by the feeling of vulnerability, foolishness and embarrassment and shame that it can sometimes bring. And so it's, it's absolutely essential that we work together. And the, this online fraud charter, which really, you know, I should pay tribute to Meta, who've uh, signed up to it, and it's really important work done by... Uh, my colleague Anthony Brown uh, really put his back into it and made it happen uh, and uh, has delivered a, an agreement to improve verification of individuals online. So whether it's, I'm afraid, something else you've reported about, which is dating fraud, where people claim to be uh, somebody who they, they're not and then you f they follow up with a romance scam, or whether it's on a market site, you know, eBay or a Facebook marketplace, you know, making sure that verification is there so you know who you're dealing with is incredibly important. Second thing is uh, stopping scams. So if, if you report a scam, it's actually taken down quickly. And the third is blocking fraud. So when the company itself sees a pattern, sees a, a, 
identifies a route that may be fraudulent, they block it even before you notice it. And I think the, the combination of those three is incredibly important to protect the British people and to protect us all, particularly as we're going to start shopping a bit more online probably in coming weeks. <laughs> Absolutely. I've done all my Christmas shopping. Oh, well, you're much more organised than I am, Kay. <laughs> I have all not. All done. Don't tell my kids, but I have not yet started. <laughs> I'm a celebrity. Does it make it look as though a Nigel Farage would be a good Conservative leader going forward? Uh, look, I don't, I don't think he would be. He's made, he's made his case extremely clearly for a number of years, which is he's, he's opposed pretty much every Conservative leader we've had for the last 30 Five, I think so, 30 or so years, so I, I don't think he's going to be a Conservative leader. Have you been watching him? Uh, I haven't, actually. I, I've only seen some clips on Twitter where he's been... I have to say, he's been quite funny sometimes. Yeah, not necessarily intentionally. No, <laughs> <laughs> It's good to see you. Thanks <laughs> nice to see you, Kate. Thank you.